Hey, welcome to our Bible study here at St. Matthew's on this Wednesday night. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join with us tonight as we study God's Word together. What a joy it is to be with you now, and I'm thankful for this chance to get to spend time with you digging a little deeper into God's Word. We're going to continue tonight talking about evangelism. The last few weeks we've spent time talking about evangelism. Uh, first night we talked about the power of our testimony, the power of our story. Last Wednesday we talked about how we can use Romans, uh, the Roman road uh, tool to share the gospel with individuals. Tonight we're going to be looking at someone who I think was perhaps the greatest evangelist in the Bible. One of two. We're going to look at Paul tonight and look at, some, look at what we can learn about evangelism from Paul's story. But it's, I said the greatest evangelist, and as I was thinking through my notes for this, it's funny. I, I said Paul would be the greatest evangelist, but now that I think through it, man, Peter, Peter had quite the run as well. Uh, Peter uh, spoke at Pentecost Sunday, and with Peter's sermon on Pentecost Sunday, thousands were saved. And the church exploded from just several dozen folks in the upper room to um, thousands within no time. So God used Peter to, to really uh, proclaim the gospel. But I want to talk tonight about Paul. And um, Paul is an interesting individual in the life of Scripture. Uh, he's one of my favorite characters in all the Bible. Um, Paul's story is told in the book of Acts. But Paul's message is preached throughout the rest of the, of the New Testament because Paul wrote basically the vast majority of the books in the New Testament after Acts. He wrote uh, called the Pauline Epistles. Uh, these are letters that Paul wrote. Most of them, Paul, Paul, one thing you think about Paul's works compared, Paul's letters compared to the other, other letters in the Bible, and we talked about this last month, last summer, last year, rather, in our uh, Bible study. We talked about the Bible and how the Bible's made up. Paul's letters were always specific. Paul was always writing to a specific church, to a specific person. Uh, Paul's letters were never in general. So, like, Hebrews was written in general. Um, uh, James was written in general. These weren't tasked to a specific person or to a specific church. Paul was always very personal. One of the reasons why Paul's letters were always personal is because Paul was always writing back to churches that he helped start. Um, Paul, in Paul's story, as I said, is told in the book of Acts. And we meet Paul early on in the book of Acts. We, we meet Paul in... Um, in chapter 9, uh, well, actually, we meet Paul before that. We, um, we meet Paul at the end of chapter 7. But in chapter 7 and chapter 9, he wasn't called Paul. He was called Saul. Saul was a young man. He was a leader of the Jewish uh, people. He was, uh, in chapter 7, we see Stephen stoned to death, the first Christian martyr. The text says that they laid their coats at the feet of Saul. Um, some would say this means that Saul was just a young servant helping out in this moment. That's not what I believe because we fast forward to a chapter later in chapter 9 or two chapters later in chapter 9. We see that Saul is on a secret mission to go to Damascus to destroy the church there. So the high priest is not going to send some young uh, servant on a mission like this. He's going to send one of his most trusted lieutenants. He sends Saul. So Saul's on the way to Damascus, and on the way to Damascus, he encounters the Lord, and the Lord appears to him physically, and the Lord gives him a specific mission. He is to go forth and preach the gospel, and he will bring the good news of salvation to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles will come to know Christ as Lord because of Paul's ministry. Now, Gentiles, of course, for those of you that don't know, Gentiles means non-Jewish. The church started out as a movement within the Jewish community, and then the Jewish people, and then uh, that Peter primarily was often seen as the apostle to the Jews. Then Paul comes along. Well, he's Saul now. He has not yet, the Lord has not yet changed his name. The Lord changes his name. And in the Bible, changing your name is symbolic for God changing who you are. Think of all the people in the Bible that God changed their name. Abram to Abraham. Um, Jacob to Israel. Simon to Peter. When God changes your name, he's changing who you are. It's, he's changing your very nature. He's changing your being. You're getting to use some of our common language today, you're getting saved. So Paul got saved on the Damascus Road, and the Lord changed his name. So Saul becomes Paul, and he becomes an apostle to the Gentiles. What this means is this. In the Bible, I had a, I had a conversation with this about, my, about this with my um, Friday morning Bible study that I lead or work with. And uh, 
in that, we see that the word, the word apostle historically means an individual to whom Christ physically appeared and gave a specific mention. So Paul was known as the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul was, Jesus appeared to him in the flesh, it physically appeared to him in Genesis, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 9, and gave him a specific, a specific mission to be the apostle to the Gentiles, to take the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. So from there on out, what Paul does is Paul goes into all the world, and he brings the good news of salvation through Christ to the Gentiles, those who are not Jewish. So the book of Acts, we still see a little bit of Peter in, um, in chapter 10 and then into chapter 11. But then once we get to around um, chapter chapter uh, chapter 13, the rest of the book of Acts is Paul's story. Paul and Barnabas going off, preaching and teaching. And Paul uh, goes and he does a lot of preaching. So we think of Paul as an evangelist. There are, a couple of, there are a couple examples in Scripture, though, where Paul does more of a one-on-one -on -one type of witnessing to somebody. So I want, I want to kind of point out sometimes in Scripture where Paul, uh, excuse me, where, where Paul um, does some one, what we think of as one-on-one -on -one witnessing. <coughs> the first one of these is going to be in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, we see Paul and Silas in prison. Um, this is this is in uh, excuse me in Philip in Philippa, and so in Philippa, uh, Paul and Peter, I'm sorry, Paul and Silas are in prison, and they're singing, they're praising, they're worshiping the prison, and an earthquake happens, and uh, and, and the 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 cell of the jail is broken down, and they can escape. The jailer comes in and sees the gate, the, the door, the the door is broken. And he begins to kill, he's going to kill himself because in that culture, the jailer is responsible for the prisoners with his life. So if the prisoners had escaped, the jailer would then be held liable for that and he would probably be executed. So the jailer is just going to kill himself because he has, you know, he's failed at his, his task. And so he's going to kill himself. Paul says, no, pa Paul says this. But Paul, this is, this is chapter 16, verse, verse 28. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and, and Silas. They brought them outside and said to them, Sirs, what, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke, spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. That same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds, and then he and his entire family were baptized without, without delay. He brought them into the house and set food before them. He and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. So, they're in the jail. The earthquake happens. The jailer comes in, sees what's happened, he's going to kill himself. And Paul says, no, 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 don't. We're, we're still here. We're still here. And at that point, this goes back to one of the verses that you heard me talk about during the study, 1 Peter 3.15, always to be ready to have a defense for the hope that you have. When the jailer comes in and sees that they're still in their cell, when <laughs> anybody else in their right mind would have left, and they're still there, um, he, um, he's like, there's something different. What do I need to do? I think the first thing we're going to see in Paul, how Paul tells his story, and I believe this to be true, we never need to run away from using our words to proclaim the gospel. Uh, you know, there's that old quote I've shared with you before that's attributed, attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, um, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. That, that's true, but we don't need to run away from using our words to proclaim the gospel. Because as Revelation tells us, the devil is defeated by the blood of the lamb and the power of their testimony. So using our words to proclaim the gospel is a good thing. We don't need to be ashamed of that ever. We need to always be able and willing to proclaim the gospel with our words. But... Paul had to live in Paul. Paul's life was such a powerful example of the goodness of Jesus that Paul didn't have to tell folks he was a Christian. They saw that his life was different, and they wanted what Paul had, so they don't escape. 
Paul calls out, do not harm yourself, for we're here. And he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What do I need to do to have what y'all have? What do I have to do to be a Christian like you are? What is it that you have that I don't have that I want to have? And Paul then says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole house. Hey, you've heard me say it a thousand times, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Nothing else. It's all about Jesus. So, so Paul here lives a radically different life and then shares the good news. I, I think, y'all, I don't think we've got to worry about living a perfect life. We've got to live a different life. A life of different, faithful, and radical obedience to Jesus. This life that makes us all a little different. This life that, um, this life that is in stark contrast to the world that we live in today, in all of its ways, um, in our individual ethics, but our individual kindness. You know what Paul showed to the jailer here? He showed kindness. Because there's, there's examples in Scripture of people getting, Peter got out of jail. You know, angels got him out of jail and he just went home. Paul stayed here. Paul knew that his escape, their escape, would result in death for the jailer. So Paul stayed in spite of the inconvenience that would have been to him. Paul stayed. He showed kindness to the jailer. It's a big deal. So the guy says, what do I have to do to be saved? Believe on Jesus. Believe on Jesus. There are other examples in the book of Acts where Paul preaches. But the things that I'm really interested in aren't Paul's preaching events, because Paul preaches a lot. But, um, what what I really want what I, what I what I really am fascinated by from Paul is what we see in Acts twenty two, but then more specifically in Acts twenty four and in Acts twenty six. What's happening in these stories is Paul is telling the telling his story of conversion, telling his Damascus road, telling how he got saved, and so the twenty two passage. He is in a, he's before the Sanhedrin. He's, uh, he, he's before a large crowd of, uh, of religious leaders. And in that setting, he then um, goes about, in verse 6, says, Well, I was on my, way to, on my way and approaching Damascus about noon, and a great light from heaven suddenly shone about me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light but did not hear the voice. And I asked, what am I to do, Lord? The Lord said, get up and go to Damascus. There will be told everything that you have been assigned to do. And he tells um, what happened. Then verse 17 tells about him being sent to the Gentiles. He tells his story. And eventually he makes them mad and they send him off. He, he appeals to Rome. Then verse chapter 24, we see him before Felix. Um, who is one of the uh, um, Felix is a governor of, of that part of the world for Rome. So when the governor motioned for him to speak, this is this is Acts twenty four. Paul replied, "I cheerfully make my defense, knowing that you have many years for many years you've been a judge over this nation. As you can find out, it is not more than 12 days since I went, went to worship in Jerusalem. They did, not find me dispute, they did not find me disputing with anyone in the temple or stirring up the crowd, neither the synagogues throughout the city. Neither the, the, can they prove to you about the charge they are now bringing against me. Well, I'll admit that according to the way which, is, uh, that w which they call a sect, I worship the God of our ancestors. Um, so he goes on to, um, to, to, to tell... Of his, of, his, of, his, of his story here. He defends himself here before Felix. Then Agrippa comes in next. Um, 
uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the kings, and he tells the story here. He says, um, I spent my way among the Jewish people. I wanted to testify. Um, I do, I'll do many things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and that's what I did in Jerusalem. I received orders. I locked up many. I was traveling to Damascus. This is Acts 26, verse 12. Traveling to Damascus with the authority to commission the chief priest when at midday along the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun. And I heard, all, I heard a voice in Hebrew saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? The Lord answered, I'm Jesus. Uh, get up, stand on your feet. And then he tells his story there. And Agrippa has this great moment. He says, do you want me to be like you? And Paul says, I want you to be like me except for my chains. He was almost persuaded. So Paul here in Acts three times tells the story of his conversion. Tells the story of what happened to him. We see with the Philippian jailer that his life was so different that he, um, that he was able to give witness to what Jesus had done in his life. And then the jailer, jailer wanted to know what was different about Paul. And Paul says, what's well, Jesus? Believe on Jesus and you shall be saved. Then before the, then before the Sanhedrin, then before Agrippa, I'm sorry, before Felix, and then before, and then be, be, before Agrippa, he tells the story three times. Paul is able to articulate in his life the moments that Jesus made a difference for him. He's able to explain to the individuals there what Jesus did for him. And I think that is really the point of evangelism is to share with others what Jesus has done for us and how we have, we have become a different person because of what Jesus has done and because of the work of Jesus within our lives. That, that Paul makes a huge difference in our life and that makes a huge difference. Jesus makes a huge difference in our life and Jesus makes a huge difference in who we are. Paul was never afraid to tell the story. I want to share with you from Galatians. I've been reading Galatians in our morning readings these last few weeks. This is Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. For won't you know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed to me is not of human origin, for I did not receive it from a human source, nor was, it, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Hey, we've heard that story, haven't we? <laughs> You've heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I was advanced in Judaism beyond, beyond many among my people the same age. For I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But God, who had set me apart before I was born, had called me through its grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, that I might, might proclaim him among the Gentiles. I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go to Jerusalem, those who are already apostles before me. But I went away at once to Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Paul constantly, constantly, constantly tells a story of what God had done for him. He tells it in verbal form, as he did before the Sanhedrin, as he did before the kings, as he did before the governors. He tells it in written form as he did um, here before uh, the Galatians. He told a story of what God had done. I love to tell the story. For those who know it best, seem hungry and thirsting to hear it like, a, like the rest. Evangelism is not some complicated formula. Evangelism is not you having all the answers. You have everything figured out. But I think Paul in his life is a great example for us for what evangelism looks like. It's one individual telling everyone he can about what God had done for him. About what, it's one individual telling everyone in his orbit, everyone in his world, everyone that he knows about the goodness and the grace of God in his life to make him a different person, to transform him, and to cause him to be different. 
Start telling your story. So what do you do? You've heard me talk about, say, telling your story. What are, what are some practical ways that we can tell our stories? I want to give you just a few ways that you can, that you can tell your story. The first is this, and if you follow me on social media, you see me do this a lot. I, I tell my story a lot on social media. I tell the story of what God's done in my life um, through my conversion, <laughs> through, my, through the many ways that God has humbled me in my life. I tell my story about how God has saved me and delivered me early in my life and now, and repeatedly now. I tell this God's story for what I'm learning in my life each day. If you're on social media, Lord knows there's a bunch of noise on there. There's a bunch of opinions on there. There's a bunch of things like that. You know what we need more of on social media? It's people telling, it's us telling the stories of what Jesus has done in our life. And it may not be much. I mean, listen, I understand that my story is like Paul. My story is like Paul. I, I, I get it. I, I, I get it. But, but let me let me let you on a little secret. Let me let you on a little secret. Yeah, my story is crazy. I mean, my Father murdered my mother. I mean, yeah, that's a crazy story. Some of you may say that, golly, my story does nothing like Andy's story, so how can I share it? Listen, most people don't have my story. Most people's lives are pretty normal. Most people's, li most people's lives don't have a lot of violence or things like that. My story's abnormal. Most likely, your story's closer to normal than mine. And that's what people need to hear. What we've done is we've mythologized faith. We've mythologized conversion. We mythologize all these things. We think that every conversion has to be running down the aisle with tears in our eyes getting saved. Or that every conversion experience has to go from being a drunk in the street or a murderer to somebody turning the corner and being a preacher. No. Sarah, Soren Kierkegaard said, following Jesus is always the hardest decision. It is hard for you to follow Jesus in your life, in this moment, as it is for me to follow Jesus in this life in my moment. It's always a challenge. It's always difficult. Tell somebody what Jesus has done for you. Tell somebody in your life what Jesus has done for you. They need to hear that. They need to know that. Share what Jesus has done in your life. That's what the world needs to hear. The world does not need more noise and more loud and more of these things. Use your platform if you have one to share what Jesus has done. So I would say if you're on social media, use that. Use that. That's a great platform to tell others what Jesus is doing or has done in our lives. And this goes along with that. Write, write it down. Write your story down. It, it, it's hard sometimes to, I know that everybody's not a preacher. <laughs> you know, I don't mind running my mouth. <laughs> I'm, glad to, I'm glad to run my mouth all day long. That's what I like doing. I, get to, I tell folks, I'm a preacher. I get paid to talk and eat. I mean, I'm glad to do it. Um, but in that, write it down. Keep it with you. I have a, I think I showed this to you a few weeks back. I keep my, my prayer request here with me all the time. Now I have another notebook in my back pocket, too. I have my, my thought journal. Uh, I keep this with me, too. It's a, these pretty tough notebooks I wrote that I can that, that survive a lot, so I keep these with me, and I, I write notes all the time of what I'm thinking about or what I need to be working on or what I'm dreaming about. Write it down. And even if you don't feel comfortable sharing it, when you write it down, it reminds you of what God's done. One of my favorite passages is from the book of Philemon, where Paul writes, always be active in sharing your faith so that we're, we're, you're reminded of what a great thing we have in Jesus Christ. When we tell somebody about Jesus, we're reminded of how good Jesus is and how good he's been to us. So tell somebody about it. Write it down. Write it down. Remember what God has done. And then find out opportunities in your life. I don't think you've got to. I don't think you've got to shoehorn Jesus into every conversation you have. Hey, man, how about the Super Bowl this week? Isn't it going to be exciting? Isn't it going to be great, man? You know what else is exciting? Jesus. 
<laughs> okay, that might, that might not be the, be the most opportune time to do that. But you're saying, you know what, you know, I love, man, I love football. You know, I'm, a, I'm an Ole Miss fan. That's a painful life, you know, but some of the, some of the, some of the best moments of my life were, you know, at Ole Miss football games. What, what, how about you? What, what, are some, what are some places in your life that's been a good chance for you, opportunity, moment, moment for you? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, you know, you know, I'm married. I got two kids, a wife. Yeah, they mean a lot to me. Yeah, you know, my, my family's so precious to me. Yeah, and my faith is really precious to me as well. And let me tell you why. You make your faith part of the conversation. You don't have to lead with it. That might freak people, freak people out. You don't have to shove it. You don't have to. You don't have to force them to make a decision either. When I share my faith with somebody, I'm not trying to force them to make a conversation. I mean, force them to make a decision in that moment. And if they're ready to make a decision, I'll talk to them about it. But I just want to. We're talking about music. You know, I love the Beatles. I love Jason Isbell. I love George Clay or Switchfoot. You know, I'll, 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 I'll circle in some Christian music and conversation I have about music. You know, talking about books, you know, while talking some of the histories I read. And then I might branch over into how much I love going to Israel. You know, C.S. Lewis talked about the book Chronicles of Narnia. And he says this, he did not intend when he wrote Narnia, to write a Christian allegory. It just kind of happened. He's writing a book about magic, and the gospel came out. You don't have to shoehorn the gospel into every conversation that you have. But what you want to do is you want your life to be so bathed with the grace of Jesus Christ that it just kind of comes out. So I want the gospel in my life to, I want to be talking about football or baseball or music or Jesus or computers or history or the Holy Spirit. I want it to just be a part of who I am. So I think for us kind of a conclusion tonight, the key to us in witnessing or sharing our faith is to make sure that our faith is real to us. I think about something Brother, Brother Bill Poole used to always say when we were kids at Johnson Chapel. Brother Bill always told us, it stuck with me throughout all the years, Brother Bill would always say, you can't give witness to what you don't know. It's always stuck with me. You can't give witness to what you don't know. The way our faith becomes real to us and impacts others is for our faith to really be real to us. Just like we don't want to shoehorn Jesus into every conversation, and we want to be an authentic part of our conversation. We don't need to shoehorn Jesus into our lives, but he just needs to be an authentic part of who we are. Just like our sports teams, or our music, or our family. He's just a part of who we are. And when Jesus authentically becomes just a part of your existence and a part of who you are, that's when he really becomes real to us. And that's when our faith story really becomes real. So I hope for you tonight that that's what Jesus is to you. He's not a good luck charm. He's not an incantation. But he's something truly real in your life. And my prayer that as he is real in your life, he's real in your faith, he's real in who you are, that he'll be a part of every conversation you're part, every part of every moment of your life. Hey, I hope you're enjoying these conversations on evangelism. Uh, next week, we're, we're going to talk about James and how our lives can really proclaim the gospel. We talked a lot about words. Next week, we are going to talk about our lives the difference that our service can make in proclamation of the gospel. So thanks for watching tonight. hope you enjoy these. And I'll be worship with us Sunday. We'll be out in front lawn this week um, or online. We'd love to have you worship with us. And we have some exciting things about Ash Wednesday in the days to come. Love you guys. Thanks for watching tonight. Uh, see you tomorrow morning for our morning reflections. Uh, thanks for joining us for Bible study.